All right, so uh, now it's time for the fundamental theorem of calculus. Very important calculus uh, uh, theorem. It's the fundamental one. Um, so to give you a little bit of a, a heads up and a clue as to where we're going here, um, think about this symbol and what it meant the first time we saw it. What was I asking you to find here? I was asking you to find some function that has this as a derivative, right? what we came to call the antiderivative of this function. It's also called the indefinite integral. Um, so the indefinite integral would be one third x to the third plus c, right? So um, this function has this derivative. Then more recently the symbol was used again and we then gave it limits of what we call integration and if I wanted you to find that I was basically asking you to find uh, on the, the curve of x squared find the area under that curve from a to b, whatever a and b are. So, uh, and we call this the definite integral, so it's kind of interesting that this is called the indefinite integral, and this is the definite integral, almost like this is general, this is more specific, somehow these are related, um, this one's like it's, like it's not quite finished or something, um, and that this makes it more definite, where this is indefinite, but they're definitely related, and um, we are going to, uh, through the fundamental theorem of calculus, find out how. Um, and rather than show you like, a big long proof of it, which is actually quite neat and elegant, um, we're going to talk about it more in, uh, specifically, talk about a specific example. So I'm going to give you this uh, to think about. We're just going to discuss it through this example. We have a function here. Uh, and we only have one data point in this function at this point, that uh, on the x-axis we get seconds, and on the y-axis we have meters per second, which is kind of um, kind of different, kind of weird, because um, we would typically have seconds and then meters. I would say after two seconds you've gotten four meters, right? But we're saying, uh, specifically here, after 10 seconds, or at 10 seconds, we measure a person, let's say that they're running in a race, we measure a person going 9.49 meters per second. So what we're going to want to do is calculate how far this person has traveled. To do that, at this point, we kind of have to make some assumptions. Um, we, we don't know anything else besides this one data point. So if we're going to use the data, we're going to have to say, well, we assume that he's always traveling at 9.49 meters per second over the entire 10 seconds. Uh, that's not very realistic for a race, but hey, maybe they had started at 9.49 meters per second, ran that speed the whole time for the whole 10 seconds. That's just what we're going to assume. So how are we going to calculate how far this person ran? So based on how uh, fast they're moving and how long they, they moved that fast, how do we calculate how far they've gone? Well, there's a simple relationship between those three things. Distance equals rate times time. Um, so we'll take the rate and we'll multiply it by the time. Take the rate of 9.49 meters per second times 10 seconds, and we get 94.9 meters. Okay. So if this person has been traveling at 9.49 meters per second for the full 10 seconds, they'll have traveled 94.9 meters. Um, but that's just, that would be a really safe assumption to make if this person was in a race. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get more data then. That's what we need. this over. Let's see if we can get rid of that guy. So now we know that after five seconds, uh, this guy, or at five seconds, this person is traveling at 6.71 meters per second um, at the five second mark. Okay, then we know that uh, at 10 seconds they were running 9.49 meters per second. So to get a more accurate idea of how, fat or how far they've gone, now we can say, well, between 0 and 5 seconds, we'll just say that they were going 6.71 meters per second. And then between 5 and 10 seconds, we'll say that they had just jumped up and were running 9.49 meters per second. 
not very realistic, but it's all the information we have to go on. So again, um, rate times time. So on this time interval, uh, it was five seconds. So they traveled 6.71 meters per second for five seconds. And then we'll add, they're going 9.49 meters per second for this five seconds, not for 10 seconds, but from five seconds to 10 seconds. So a total of five seconds. So 9.49 times 5. 9.49 meters per second times 5 seconds. Okay, so we do that math and we get for this interval here that he has gone 33.55 meters running at 6.71 meters per second for 5 seconds and then for 5 seconds he runs 9.49 meters per second and that is 47.45 and then altogether, if you add it all up, then we have a total, let's say a big D distance of 81. Okay, less distance than 94.9, .9, but more accurate. Um, we have more information. Okay, so this is a good place. It's like a checkpoint here. Um, if if you, you know you're following along, fine. If you're understanding that every uh, time we get a new da data point, we're gonna assume that he's running that fast for the time interval. Um, that you know it kind of breaks up um, and we're gonna every time take the rate of his of his running you know the rate of change of his distance really um, you know for every second he's gaining 6.71 meters we're gonna take that rate and multiply it by the time and get the distance so if you're on board with that, you're getting it, that makes sense, right? Distance equals rate times time, I'll take the rate, I'll multiply it by the time, and I will get the uh, the distance. Uh, or another way to look at it as the time interval is the change in time, delta t. And this is delta t as well, so uh, in this case, delta t is equal to five seconds. So um, for five seconds, he is uh, going these rates of speed. All right, so let's uh, get more data. We'll get a few more data points. All right, and we'll calculate his distance for each of these subintervals. So this one's going to be, uh, well, delta t is going to be equal to two and a half seconds. So each time he's running two and a half seconds, he's running uh, 4.74 meters per second for that time. He's running 6.71 meters per second for this two and a half seconds. And for this two and a half seconds, he's running 8.22 meters per second. And for this two and a half seconds, he's running 9.49 meters per second. Okay, so we're breaking it up into more and more and more subintervals is kind of the idea. Well, that's exactly the idea, not kind of the idea. All right, so for this sub-interval, um, we'll say he's running 4.75 times two and a half, two and a half seconds. And here he's running 6.71 meters per second for two and a half seconds. And here he's running 8.22 meters per second for two and a half seconds, so times 2.5. And here he's going 9.49 for two and a half seconds. So now we'll find all of those distances. And we'll get 11.88 um, meters, 16.78 uh, meters, 20.63, 20.64, this is, yeah, that's fine, 23.73. Uh, okay, we'll get a big distance of, we just have to add all these together, we'll do that real quick. Okay, so we get 73.02. And we'll do one more. We'll get one more set of data that uh, is just 
more and more subintervals. Right. Um, and for each subinterval, we'll just say the rate of change. We'll just assume he's been running 3.35 meters per second this entire time. And we'll multiply 3.35 by that change in time. So that delta t here is point, or say 1.25. So every time we'll just take times 1.25. So we get what we're doing here. We're going to multiply 3.35 by 1.25, 4.74 by 1.25. And so we're going to break all of this up into eight subintervals. Sorry, these lines are kind of slanty. And on this subinterval, we'll find out how far he traveled, how far he traveled, how far he traveled for each of these subintervals. Okay, and then we'll we'll fill these in and and add them all up. Um, and when we find all those values, then there we have them all. Um, and let's just quickly remind ourselves what these are. Um, we assume that this this guy ran 3.35 meters per second for 1.25 seconds. And so we take 3.325 times 1.125 and find that over that time he would have ran 4.19 meters. And we do the same for each subinterval uh, with a delta t of 1.25. Uh, so here he runs 8.22 meters per second uh, for this subinterval here. Um, and so we do 8.22 times 1.25 and find that he ran 10.28 for that subinterval. So we add those all up. We get a grand total of 68.4 meters. Okay. Uh, so you see how we just keep uh, dividing it into smaller and smaller subintervals and doing the uh, the his velocity times time, his rate times time for each subinterval, and just add those all up. What I want to bring our attention to is while we are finding the distance by finding the 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 uh, the speed times the time, the rate of change times the time, um, you see what I'm tracing out there is a rectangle. So we are finding the distance that could also be uh, interpreted as the area of this rectangle, where you have the rate times time, rate times delta t. And we could have the area of this rectangle added to that, this, and we do that for eight rectangles. Uh, so while we are finding the distance, we also are finding the area of a rectangle that is the rate times the time. Same for over here. We're finding these rectangles. Rate times time uh, could give us distance. It also could give us the area of these rectangles and these rectangles. and this big one here. So the more times we divide it into, uh, you know, the more subintervals we use, the better approximation we're going to get. So let's look at this sketch, uh, which also shows us that same thing. Um, we have this function that is describing the, uh, that I just made up, um, that along every point on this function, we're saying that that's his velocity. Um, We've done it up to eight subintervals, right? At 10 seconds, this would be at five seconds. This is at 1.25 seconds, and what we're saying is um, we're, we're going to find the area of each of these rectangles, which actually it turns out uh, could also be translated as the distance that he travels on that subinterval. So, if we want to have a better approximation, we just increase the number of subintervals, and so we're now at 104, and we're getting really good. If we go past, you know, get close to 500, this computer can't even um, show you the insides of any rectangle. It's all sides, right? It's just the side of the rectangles. Um, so it's having trouble even drawing that. So it's definitely a close approximation to the area under the curve. But also, remember what that approximation is made up of. It's all these little rectangles, which each one of them is a rate 
times the time. And so we're adding up all the areas of these rectangles, which are also, for their, each of their subintervals, um, are uh, a distance that he travels over that amount of time. Uh, so if we go ahead and grab a picture of this. So now we, we uh, have that image, and we can see, again, that each of those rectangles uh, is approximating a, uh, a, a distance traveled over that subinterval. So if we let all those subintervals, or that, the number of subintervals or rectangles, go to infinity, like we've done before in the previous sections, uh, we um, are going to be finding the area under that curve by adding up all of those rectangles. And um, so what we're finding, that's the definition of the, the uh, definite integral from A to B of a function f of x dx. Um, actually, I'm just going to move this over here and right the other way. Okay. So we're finding the definite integral from A to B of this function. In this case, the function is this velocity function. Okay, so that's what we found. Um, but also think about this function. It describes the velocity. This guy here is the velocity function. Um, so let's see if we can write on here and say this is the velocity function. Um, so the velocity function is the derivative of the um, of the distance function. As we call it, dis distance. The derivative of the distance function is the velocity function. Okay. So to find the distance traveled, we can take the velocity function, and now we understand we can find the definite integral from a to b of the velocity function. Okay, that's f of x, in this case is v of x, but we're stating it generally over here. Um, so this is equal to the distance traveled. Right? The distance traveled, like, th this is a specific example describing a general, um, a general situation here. Uh, so if that's true, What's another way we can take, uh, we can find the distance traveled? Um, well, if we had a distance function, we could just say, well, take the distance at the end and subtract the distance at the beginning, and that also gives you the distance traveled. Um, that's, you know, that's true all the time. If I'm traveling along and at this point A, I've traveled 200 miles, and at this point B, I'm at 500 miles, right? I've traveled. So in between, I'll just take the, the value of the function at the end, 500, minus the value of the function at the beginning, 200, I've traveled 300. Right? You just take the distance function at the end minus the distance function at the beginning, and you get the change in distance. So it, the way that translates over here, if the distance function is the antiderivative of the velocity function, um, then, in general, the, the uh, definite integral from a to b of f of x could also, the same thing could also be found by taking the antiderivative of this function, which we usually call big F of x, um, taking it at the end of the interval minus the value of the function at the beginning of the interval, uh, and that would give us the same thing. So hopefully by this specific example of somebody running a race and, uh, and us tracking their velocity at, uh, at steady subintervals, we've um, kind of displayed, at least in a specific example, we've displayed this, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, if, if some of that made sense and some of it went over your head, 
I'd encourage you to go back uh, and review that. Um, it's it, it's a little bit of a difficult thing to understand. Um, that example was not an easy one for me to come up with and, and break down and uh, make the connection between these two things. Our other alternative would be to show you a really cool proof, like I said at the beginning. Um, I won't go into that. Um, I'll just stay with uh, the, the specific example that we talked about. So we, uh, we broke it down to subintervals. We found the distance traveled, which we discovered was also the, the same as the area of this little rectangle. Um, and then we said, well, if we want to get a better approximation, we let the number of subintervals sub increase to infinity. Okay, the, the more subintervals we use, the, the better approximation of the area we get. But the area is just the, the sum of all the areas of those rectangles. Um, and each of those rectangles is a distance over that subinterval. Um, and so we come up with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's break this down a little bit, state it a little differently, um, and then we'll be done. So if you want to find the definite integral of a function um, over some interval, we, all we need to do is take this function, find its antiderivative, take the antiderivative at the end minus the antiderivative at the beginning. Um, let's do one quick example. Uh, if my computer doesn't crash. Okay, so let's find the definite integral from 3 to 5 of 2x uh, dx. Okay, so this is a, a function that looks like this. Uh, it's 2x, so it's got it's this line that has a slope of 2. Um, and from 3 to 5, we want to find the area under the curve. Okay, that's a fairly simple shape, and we can do that without much difficulty. Um, but rather than taking this and breaking it in up into the limit as n approaches infinity of the of b minus a over n times the the, the sum and, and doing all that, we can just say, well, this is f of x. That's right over here f of x is 2x. So what is big F of x? What is 2x's antiderivative? Well, it's x squared plus c. You'll find that c doesn't matter here in a second, not in the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if I want to find this definite integral, I can just take the value of the antiderivative at 5 and subtract the value of the antiderivative at 3. Amazing. It's so amazing, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, so we'll take x squared plus c, we'll plug in 5, so we'll get 5 squared plus c minus 3 squared plus c. You see why that c doesn't matter. c minus c cancels out. So we get 25 minus 9, 16. Just so fast. Uh, just, it's incredible. The, the connection between a function and its antiderivative and, and just by taking the value of the antiderivative at, at one end of the interval minus the value of the antiderivative at the beginning, uh, the, 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 the left side of the interval, we find the area under this curve. It's just an amazing thing. Um, so um, uh, I'll, I'll get a, another video up of, of some sample problems, um, uh, but hopefully that'll help you with a little bit of your intuition, your understanding of why. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus and why it's true. I'm just going to write it again because it's so fun to write. It's amazing that it's true. All right, well, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Um, see you later.